Father Malachi Finnegan, a priest who rose to become president of a highly prestigious Catholic grammar school, St. Coleman's College in Newry. But his smile disguised his true nature. He was a prolific sexual abuser, so powerful he was able to assault boys over four decades. The one thing I can remember is the physical bulk of the guy and the smell of cigarettes. That still seared my brain. It's almost celebrating, telling me, I was a man now, you're a man now. He kept repeating, you're a man now. He thought he could do whatever he liked and, and, and get away with it. Tonight we ask, what did the Catholic Church know about the abuse? When did it know? And what did it do with the information? Father Malachi Finnegan is buried here, in this cemetery in Warren Point in County Down. When I first visited, his grave was marked with an ornate headstone. Now it's gone, carried away under cover of darkness just before Christmas. One condition of an extraordinary out-of-court settlement between the Catholic Church, St Coleman's College and one of Malachi Finnegan's many victims. That was the single biggest thing that has helped me because it stopped me from visiting my mother because I couldn't get to her grave without passing his and when I first mentioned that I wanted that moved a lot of people said to me look that that'll never happen but the day I saw that the headstone and all had been removed, I didn't feel as if I'd won anything because of the torture I'd had to go through at the hands of that man. But I'd be lying if I didn't say that, that I got some sort of peace that, that I can go to my mother's grave now without stirring at Balaghi Finnegan's name on a big cross. I first met the man we'll call Patrick in November. His case against the church and the school was about to come to court. He has chosen to conceal his face to protect his children, but he's allowed us to use his voice. He's convinced that without his case, Malachi Finnegan would have remained one of the church's darkest secrets. Patrick's solicitor, Claire McKeegan, helped secure the settlement, including the removal of Finnegan's headstone. That was something that the victim felt very strongly about and pushed for. It's unthinkable for victims of this man to have to encounter such a thing. Malachi Finnegan died in 2002. His funeral was here, in St Peter's in Warren Point. The service was led by this man, the current Bishop of Dromore, Dr John McAreevy. At the time, he was reported to have told the congregation of a man with a wide circle of friends. He now says he tried to steer away from eulogising him. But there can be no doubt that at the time, he knew Malachi Finnegan was a serial paedophile. I can't get my head round. At that stage, everybody connected to the school and the church knew that he was a multiple paedophile. And yet, when he dies, 
not only does he get a funeral like a priest of good standing, but the bishop officiates and gives the eulogy at a paedophile's funeral. And yet another of my many questions is why? Why did they do it? Last week, 16 years after he buried Father Finnegan as a priest of good standing, John McAreevy finally apologised. He said he'd made an error of judgement. It was something he regretted and will not repeat. The bishop also apologised to Finnegan's victims. St Coleman's College said they had removed photographs of Maliki Finnegan. But that only happened two months ago, decades after Finnegan was known to the church's hierarchy as a paedophile. Astonished and angry that to think that up until recently they still thought it was all right to have a man like that hanging in the school when, they, when they're trying to convince the next generation that they're doing things differently now. Patrick's solicitor believes the church agreed to a generous settlement because they wanted to keep the details of what happened to him out of the public domain. This is a hugely significant settlement and this was not only a monetary settlement, there were a number of measures that were agreed between the parties um, and I think it's hugely significant and in my view the only reason that any party would agree um, to uh, such a settlement is to ensure that the, the facts of the case are not heard in court and are not made public. But the truth is now emerging. Bishop McAreevy's statement last week finally revealed Maliki Finnegan to the public as a serial paedophile. Victims are coming forward, describing a cunning predator who preyed on the most vulnerable children boys like 11 year old Patrick. Can you remember the first time you encountered Father Malachi Finnegan? He was this big, larger than life, charismatic figure that just, he wouldn't have passed without saying something or putting his arm around you and asking, we, we okay? And I remember thinking he was nearly like an uncle around the place. I just thought it was really cool of him and friendly to let us to go up to the room and, and watch TV. I remember um, going up and watching um, programmes like Magpie. It was just fun and something to break up the, the evening, you know, um, and um, didn't seem any harm in it at all. As an 11-year-old boy, when did you first get an inkling that something wasn't quite right here? He he stopped me on one of the occasions in the room and he came over really close and made a comment about um, how blue my eyes were. That made me uncomfortable. And what happened after that? He would have put his arm around me and like uh, pulled me in and um, and then he touched me um, over my clothes like but touched me between my legs and um, with his hand and I just didn't know what was going on. Did you tell anyone? No. When it happened again, um, and again, it was strange because I, I remember thinking, not that he would get caught, that I, that I hope no one came in and that I would get caught. I was afraid to tell anyone. I didn't feel safe out and about, even where there was other boys, because he, he would have brushed his hand and made a conscious effort to to touch me um, where he shouldn't have been touching me, even outside, um, where there was all students running around. 
didn't seem to matter to him. He was effectively abusing you in plain sight. Yeah, looking back, I just think he, he thought he could do whatever he liked and, and, and get away with it. And in fact, that's what he did. How bad did it get? At what stage did you think, I can't take this anymore? One particular time, and it wasn't the first time that he was masturbating me, but on, and I just didn't know what, what, what's happening here, but there was one particular occasion where uh, um, he seemed to be in a hurry and it was f faster and rougher than even the time before. That, that really frightened me. Patrick claims one act of abuse was witnessed by another priest. The priest vehemently denies this and is supported by the church. Nevertheless, Patrick is one of 12 victims to have received a settlement. And it's clear that many other boys have been abused by Malachi Finnegan. One of those is now a lawyer in America. Finnegan was Paul Gilmore's Latin teacher. I was um, from a very good family in terms of religion, a very religious family. Um, I was also in those days uh, quite slight, so I was a little kid. The priest soon singled Paul out for special attention. Finnegan would take the 13-year-old to play golf. To me, he was a classic groomer. He was quite happy to take you off and um, you'd go to Royal County Down, consistent with the pattern of grooming, he'd allow you to smoke in the course. So the president of the school was taking you on outings to Royal County Down Golf Club. Did nobody think that that was strange? With the benefit of hindsight, it's, it's bizarre, um, but you've got to unpack, it's 40 years ago, and the power of the priest coming into the house. So he knew your parents? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, he'd, he'd come in, you know, he'd have a cup of tea after we played golf. At school, Finnegan took Paul out of class to a private chapel. He would then say a mass with just the two of them present. It was a private chapel, uh, much smaller, much more intimate. The same mass there. The classic opportunity for him was sign a peace. Sign a peace with him, you'd, you'd stick out the hand, and that was never enough. You know, oh no, come and show me, show me a peace, show me a love. But the benefit of hindsight is, is the, he's always pushing the boundaries, right? He's trying to get to how far can I go with this kid? And it was in his office that Finnegan went as far as he ever would with the teenager. The day in question in the office, he came round to dinner, show me how much you love me, uh, started French kissing me and robbed me the climax in, in his office on his desk. Could you remember how you felt? The one thing I can remember is the physical bulk of the guy and the smell of cigarettes. That still seared my brain. The next day, Finnegan tried to abuse Paul again. I was able to say to him that, uh, Father, this, this, was, this isn't right, this isn't right, this can't happen again. This, and he panicked. He, he, oh, no, 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 you must understand. We're just, I'm just showing my love for you. And I was like, I don't care. It's not happening again. Like Patrick, Paul was incensed. Bishop McAreevy said funeral mass for Malachi Finnegan in 2002. I sent McAreevy a note saying, how could you? He was a known paedophile. He had many victims. How can you 
honor him with this in this way. And I got some mealy-mouthed reply about um, how he'd been very careful in his eulogy not to um, add pain to the victims. It was one of a number of emails that Paul exchanged with Bishop McCreevy. And at one point, he had a meeting with the bishop. Did you ask him to put Maliki Finnegan's name into the public domain so other victims would know they weren't yes. in the room? You asked him I back want, in I, 2002, so, two, three. So I wanted it out there. I wanted him to say, Maliki Finnegan was a paedophile. These are the victims we know of. And what did he say? He wasn't going to do that. Not, not, a sh not a chance. Two weeks ago, we wrote to Bishop McCreevy with a series of questions about the church's handling of the Maliki Finnegan case. In response, the church first sent a statement to Spotlight and the media in general, in which they admitted that they'd known Father Finnegan was a paedophile since 1994. But there is no evidence that the church told police about this allegation in 1994. Sean Falloon was also being abused by Maliki Finnegan at that time. By then, Finnegan had moved to Clonduff, near Hilltown, to be a parish priest. I was an altar boy and the changing room for the altar boys um, was separate to, was a separate room from the main vestry in the back of the chapel. Finnegan was hovering. The other altar boy left and Finnegan was still hovering at the door just having conversation with me. And um, light-hearted conversation. He seemed more relaxed than normal. And then um, he didn't ask me for a hug or anything like that, he just hugged me. But um, his hugs were more like squashes. I could say squeezing, but it was more than squeezing, it was squashes. I was 10 years old. He was about 60 at the time, and he was a big man, um, heavily built. I was just squashed into him. And from there, it progressed. Finnegan took Sean for drives around County Down. Really, I lost my um, vision at when I was 11 in his car. The first time I ejaculated it in his car. And I'd, I hadn't a clue what was going on. I just felt this pain in my lower stomach. But I couldn't say I'm in pain. He just kept playing. And then it happened and everything was wet and I was panicking because I caused this mess in his car. He was almost celebrating, telling me, I was a man now, you're a man now. He kept repeating, you're a man now. And he had tissues in his glove box and cleaned me up. He took me down to the parochial house and um, put me in his bath and, and cleaned me. But all the time he wasn't smiling. The, this, the grin on his face went from ear to ear. It very quickly went from touching me up in his car and inside his house in the living room to um, going upstairs into his bed. In the parochial house? Mm -hmm. Completely naked. By 1994, you are 15? Yeah. What was the relationship like with Finnegan at that point? It was sexually intense. It was intense. Throughout the abuse, Finnegan put pressure on Sean never to tell anyone, including his family. I didn't want to let them down. And I was frightened of getting into trouble. I was frightened of it shaming my family and I was frightened of it ruining my family, ruining me. 
the words of Finnegan used every time I seen him and he at least touched me up or we had full sex. He repeated and repeated, you can't tell anyone but this. I love you, your family love you, but they won't love you if, you, if they find out about what we're doing. It was, of course, in 1994 that the church says it learned that Finnegan was a paedophile as a result of a complaint from a former St. Coleman's pupil. But rather than tell the police, the church sent Father Finnegan away for sex abuse treatment in England. Despite this, Finnegan managed to keep in contact with Sean all the way through his treatment. There was a lady in the village that was friends with Father Finnegan. And, um, she told me that Father Finnegan wanted to speak to me on her phone. I could have come to her house at, I think it was 10 or 11 o'clock on a Saturday morning. Yeah, okay. Those phone calls went, were almost every Saturday morning while he was away. During the conversation, he'd asked me about sex. He'd asked me about masturbating at home. He'd asked me about sexual thoughts for girls at school. Um, and he would check that I wasn't having sexual thoughts about him. And I wasn't. So I told him, just straightforward, no. At the end of each phone call, the lady had a present for me. And what was that? It was an envelope. Um, that's all she would have known it was, with something inside it, of course. Inside the envelope, every Saturday was £10. Hush money, really, looking back. After six months, Finnegan was allowed to return to his parish. But rather than tell the police of the risk he posed, the church settled for his assurance he would stay away from young boys. Finnegan was made to sign a contract. But almost immediately, he went back to raping Sean. It's only two days later. He and I were in his bedroom having full sex. We'd actually, that two days later, We'd gone for a drive in the car and we had only gone a mile or two out of the village and turned around. And I remember from when he turned around to the parochial house, he didn't say a word and that got me frightened. And I wasn't really wanting to do it. And I was thinking, can I have an opportunity to get out of this, to have a conversation with him about stopping it? But because he didn't say a word from when he turned around to the parochial house, that quieted me. So we went into the parochial house and went straight up to his bedroom and had sex. There was no conversation this time. In 1996, Sean, desperate to break away from Finnegan, finally found the courage to tell someone he was being abused. He went to see a GP. My name was called out and uh, I walked into the doctor's room and um, I couldn't speak and he said, take your time. And uh, I wasn't crying, but I was fighting back the tears. And um, I just blurbed it out. I've been having sex with Father Finnegan since I was 10 years old. Um, it was wrong and I can't concentrate on anything because of it. So uh, what do I do? So he asked me a few questions and he suggested speaking to a professional about it. Sean spoke to a woman from social services who said he must tell his parents and that he had to tell the authorities. She also said that the, the police need to know. And I was getting a bit frightened about that. Um, and she says, no, don't worry, you won't be getting in trouble. It's Finnegan that'll be getting in trouble for it. But she took me to Ardmore Police Station in Yerry. What did you tell the police in Ardmore at that point? I gave them time frames of what happened. I was sexually abused by a priest. Um, you named the priest? I named the priest. You told them I, you'd I, been I abused gave us, by... I gave us rough age. I told them where it happened in his car and at the parochial house. Um, I give them as much information as I could. I give them 
the time frame from start to finish. Um, I told them that he gave me a pound um, for each time that we had sex. But Sean was so frightened of causing trouble that he says he begged police not to press charges and did not make a formal complaint. We asked the police whether they now believe they should nevertheless have questioned Finnegan. They didn't answer that, but they did confirm a report of sexual and physical abuse was made by a 17-year-old in Newry on the 13th of December, 1996. At the time, Sean continued to be counseled by the woman from social services until he says there was an intervention by the then Bishop of Dromore, Gerard Brooks. Someone in my family contacted Bishop Brooks and um, to make him aware of what happened. So at that point, Bishop Brooks um, met with me. Sean says he clearly remembers Bishop Brooks encouraging him to stop counselling with the woman who'd taken him to the police. Meetings with these people could steer me away from um, my faith and how it should be dealt with. Um, what we can do is we can set you up with our um, counselling professionals and uh, we can give you all the support that you need. Sean then started counselling sessions with a nun. Towards the end of that second last session, she said to me, given time, God will forgive you. And I almost swore and I didn't hear a single word that she said for the rest of that meeting because what was stuck in my head was I really have done wrong here. The abuse is my fault. I should have stopped it. God will forgive me. In his statement last week, Bishop McAreevy did not say when the church first told the police about allegations against Maliki Finnegan, but did say the diocese had brought in a respected child safeguarding expert, Ian Elliott, to conduct a review of all allegations against priests in Dromore since 1975. His report in 2011 concluded that it was satisfied that all allegations of sex abuse had been reported to the statutory authorities. But when we spoke to Ian Elliott, he clearly resented the way his review was now being used. As well as compiling his report in 2011, Ian Elliott also acted as an expert witness in Patrick's recent case against the church. I'm angry with the statement. I am surprised that no attempt has been made to uh, check with me uh, as, uh, with regard to uh, the content of the statement before it was actually made. The church insists that it had cooperated fully with Ian Elliott's review. So you're in no doubt that I am in no have... doubt, Mandy. I'm absolutely no doubt. I visualize, I mean, I'm very good on remembering things like that. I visualize the table with every, and, and, and the Maliki Finnegan file was one file with a lot of Polly Pockets in it. I had Polly Pocketed everything. That's how the file was presented. The question remained, when did the church, as part of its duty to protect children, first tell the police? In our questions to Bishop McCreevy, he told us that he first became aware of allegations of child sex abuse against Father Malachi Finnegan when he provided pastoral support to a victim and his family in 1994. But he did not say when the police were informed. Instead, he explained that the available records show that it was the practice of Bishop Brooks to report allegations to the civil authorities. He also said that in 1995, the then bishop and his legal team were aware they had a responsibility to report this particular allegation of abuse. But he did not say if the abuse was in fact reported in 1995. Finally, this afternoon, the church put up a spokesperson to try to clarify the situation. Patricia Carvel said the abuse of Sean Falloon 
was reported in 1998, but she was less clear about the allegation in 1994. Well, of course, I wasn't in post. I wasn't in the diocese. I think procedures and policies at that stage were not as robust as they are today. Was uh, that allegation reported to police in 1994? I believe that uh, Bishop Brooks at the time did report it. Uh, I don't think it was 94. I think it's probably 95 it was reported. You don't have a date for that referral? I, I, I could not comment on that, and, and Bishop McAreevy, I'm sure, has covered it well. But Spotlight has learned that Bishop McAreevy, who was providing pastoral support, was concerned at the time that his predecessor had failed to act. One thing that Bishop McAreevy did say in his response was that as a priest, he had provided pastoral support to the victim who came forward in 1994. We therefore asked him whether or not he accepted that he had had a personal obligation at the time to make the statutory authorities aware of those accusations. But he didn't address this point. Instead, he said, it was only in 1999-2000 as bishop that he had access to the files. The bishop read out his statement at Mass in Newry Cathedral on Sunday. Uh, you'll have heard over the past few days about a deceased priest of this diocese who abused young people during his lifetime. Recent publicity about him brings us back to a dark period when those who were abused suffered alone and in silence, often not telling even those closest to them. My heart goes out to those who have suffered and who continue to suffer the effects of abuse. And I apologize again sincerely on behalf of the diocese for the abuse of young people and for failures in responding to reports of abuse. In a statement, St. Coleman's Board of Governors, whose chairman is Bishop McAreevy, says it condemns in the strongest possible terms the physical, sexual, and emotional abuse inflicted by Maliki Finnegan when he was in the employment of the college over 30 years ago. The Board of Governors is devastated that any pupil who was entrusted to the care of St. Coleman's College should ever have suffered abuse. Victims of Maliki Finnegan have contacted this programme from right across the globe, more than 15 since last week's statement. It's clear for some of them, words of condemnation and apology are late. I've had apologies and it doesn't do anything. What needs to happen now is the Catholic Church needs to open up. Let open up the doors to let the flood come out and get things dealt with. I wanted him to just put his hands up and say, we screwed up. If he'd, if he'd done that, I probably wouldn't be sitting here today. For over 40 years, I've lived with the guilt of not speaking out and that I could have beat myself up that I could have stopped someone else been abused and I now know that survivors like me it's never the child's fault and and it wasn't my fault but and I think I've lived with that guilt long enough and it's about time that the Catholic Church and all the ones connected with that school took some of the guilt off people like me. This case has brought to light yet another prolific paedophile priest who abused multiple victims over a long period of time and has never been properly investigated. Throughout this case, I could find no referral to the PSNI um, until long after uh, the uh, allegations were made um, and my call today would be for a public inquiry into clerical abuse in Northern Ireland. I think that to say 12 people were abused um, has to be only the tip of the iceberg. We know from experience of dealing with these matters that when a paedophile is prolific and has unlimited um, access to children over decades, 
um, the numbers of people that could have been abused and were abused could go into double and triple figures. Thank you.